Chapter 8 of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter 8 The Dog Gellert. Having demolished William Tell, I proceed to the destruction of another article of popular belief. Who that has visited Snowdon has not seen the grave of Llewellyn's faithful hound Gellert, and been told by the guide the touching story of the death of the noble animal? How can we doubt the facts, seeing that the place, Beth Gellert, is named after the dog, and that the grave is still visible? But, unfortunately for the truth of the legend, its pedigree can be traced with the utmost precision. The story is as follows. The Welsh Prince Llewellyn had a noble deerhound, Gellert, whom he trusted to watch the cradle of his baby son while he himself was absent. One day, on his return, to his intense horror, he beheld the cradle empty and upset, the clothes dabbled with blood, and Gellert's mouth dripping with gore. Concluding hastily that the hound had proved unfaithful, had fallen on the child and devoured it, in a paroxysm of rage the prince drew his sword and slew the dog. Next instant the cry of the babe from behind the cradle showed him that the child was uninjured, and on looking farther Llewellyn discovered the body of a huge wolf which had entered the house to seize and devour the child, but which had been kept off and killed by the brave dog Gellert. In his self-reproach and grief, the prince erected a stately monument to Gellert, and called the place where he was buried after the poor hound's name. Now, I find in Russia precisely the same story told, with just the same appearance of truth, of a Tsar Pyrrhus. In Germany, it appears, with considerable variations. A man determines on slaying his old dog Sultan, and consults with his wife how this is to be effected. Sultan overhears the conversation, and complains bitterly to the wolf, who suggests an ingenious plan by which the master may be induced to spare his dog. Next day, when the man is going to his work, the wolf undertakes to carry off the child from its cradle. Sultan is to attack him and rescue the infant. The plan succeeds admirably, and the dog spends his remaining years in comfort. Grimm, K.M. 48 But there is a story in closer conformity to that of Gellert among the French collections of Fablio made by Le Grand Dossi and Edelestran du Maril. It became popular through the Gesta Romanorum, a collection of tales made by the monks for harmless reading in the 14th century. In the Gesta, the tale is told as follows. Folliculus, a knight, was fond of hunting and tournaments. He had an only son, for whom three nurses were provided. Next to this child, he loved his falcon and his greyhound. It happened one day that he was called to a tournament, whither his wife and domestics went also, leaving the child in the cradle, the greyhound lying by him, and the falcon on his perch. A serpent that inhabited a hole near the castle, taking advantage of the profound silence that reigned, crept from his habitation, and advanced toward the cradle to devour the child. The falcon, Perceiving the danger, fluttered with his wings till he awoke the dog, who instantly attacked the invader, and after a fierce conflict, in which he was sorely wounded, killed him. He then lay down on the ground to lick and heal his wounds. When the nurses returned, they found the cradle overturned, the child thrown out, and the ground covered with blood, as was also the dog who they immediately concluded had killed the child. Terrified at the idea of meeting the anger of the parents, 
they determined to escape, but in their flight fell in with their mistress, to whom they were compelled to relate the supposed murder of the child by the greyhound. The knight soon arrived to hear the sad story, and, maddened with fury, rushed forward to the spot. The poor wounded and faithful animal made an effort to rise and welcome his master with his accustomed fondness, but the enraged knight received him on the point of his sword, and he fell lifeless to the ground. On examination of the cradle, the infant was found alive and unhurt, with the dead serpent lying by him. The knight now perceived what had happened, lamented bitterly over his faithful dog, and blamed himself for having too hastily depended on the words of his wife. Abandoning the profession of arms, he broke his lance in pieces, and vowed a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, where he spent the rest of his days in peace. The monkish hit at the wife is amusing, and might have been supposed to have originated with those determined misogynists, as the gallant Welshmen lay all the blame on the man. But the good compilers of the Gesta wrote little of their own, except moral applications of the tales they relate, and the story of Folliculus and his dog, like many others in their collection, is drawn from a foreign source. It occurs in the Seven Wise Masters, and in the Calumnia Novercalis as well, so that it must have been popular throughout medieval Europe. Now the tales of the Seven Wise Masters are translations from a Hebrew monk, the Kalila and Dimna of Rabbi Joel, composed about A.D. 1250, or from Simeon Seth's Greek Kalile and Dimni, written in 1080. These Greek and Hebrew works were derived from kindred sources. That of Rabbi Joel was a translation from an Arabic version, made by Nasser Allah in the 12th century whilst Salman Seth's was a translation of the Persian Kalila and Dimna. But the Persian Kalila and Dimna was not either an original work. It was, in turn, a translation from the Sanskrit Panchatantra, made about A.D. 540. In this ancient Indian book, the story runs as follows. A Brahmin named Devasaman had a wife, who gave birth to a son, and also to an ichneumon. She loved both her children dearly, giving them alike the breast, and anointing them alike with salves. But she feared the ichneumon might not love his brother. One day, having laid her boy in bed, she took up the water jar, and said to her husband, Hear me, master, I am going to the tank to fetch water, whilst I am absent, Watch the boy, lest he gets injured by the ichneumon. After she had left the house, the Brahmin went forth begging, leaving the house empty. In crept a black snake, and attempted to bite the child, but the ichneumon rushed at it and tore it in pieces. Then, proud of its achievement, it sallied forth, all bloody, to meet its mother. She, seeing the creature stained with blood, concluded with feminine precipitance that it had fallen on the baby and killed it, and she flung her water-jar at it and slew it. Only on her return home did she ascertain her mistake. The same story is also told in the Hidopadesa, 4.13. But the animal is an otter, not an ichneumon. In the Arabic version, a weasel takes the place of the ichneumon. The Buddhist missionaries carried the story into Mongolia, and in the Mongolian Uligaron, which is a translation of the Tibetan Tsanken, the story reappears with the pole cat as the brave and suffering defender of the child. Stanislas Julien, the great Chinese scholar, has discovered the same tale in the Chinese work entitled the Forest of Pearls from the Garden of the Law. This work dates from 668, and in it the creature is an ichneumon. In the Persian Sindibad Nama is the same tale, but the faithful animal is a cat. 
In Sandabar and Sintipas it has become a dog. Through the influence of Sandabar on the Hebrew translation of the Kalila and Dimna, the Ichnuman is also replaced by a dog. Such is the history of the Gellard legend. It is an introduction into Europe from India, every step of its transmission being clearly demonstrable. From the Gesta Romanorum it passed into a popular tale throughout Europe, and in different countries it was, like the Tell myth, localized and individualized. Many a Welsh story, such as those contained in the Mabinogion, are as easily traced to an eastern origin. But every story has its root. The root of the Gellert tale is this. A man forms an alliance of friendship with a beast or bird. The dumb animal renders him a signal service. He misunderstands the act and kills his preserver. We have tracked this myth under the Gellert form from India to Wales, but under another form it is the property of the whole Aryan family and forms a portion of the traditional lore of all nations sprung from that stock. Thence arose the classic fable of the peasant, who, as he slept, was bitten by a fly. He awoke, and in a rage killed the insect, when, too late, he observed that the little creature had aroused him that he might avoid a snake which lay coiled up near his pillow. In the Anvar Isuhaili is the following kindred tale. A king had a falcon. One day, whilst hunting, he filled a goblet with water dropping from a rock. As he put the vessel to his lips, his falcon dashed upon it and upset it with its wings. The king, in a fury, slew the bird, and then discovered that the water dripped from the jaws of a serpent of the most poisonous description. This story, with some variations, occurs in Aesop, Elian, and Aphthonius. In the Greek fable, a peasant liberates an eagle from the clutches of a dragon. The dragon spurts poison into the water, which the peasant is about to drink without observing what the monster had done. The grateful eagle upsets the goblet with his wings. The story appears in Egypt under a whimsical form. A wali once smashed a pot full of herbs which a cook had prepared. The exasperated cook thrashed the well-intentioned but unfortunate wali within an inch of his life, and when he returned, exhausted with his efforts at belaboring the man, to examine the broken pot, he discovered amongst the herbs a poisonous snake. How many brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, and cousins of all degrees this little story has! And how few of the tales we listen to can lay any claim to originality! There is scarcely a story which I hear, which I cannot connect with some family of myths, and whose pedigree I cannot ascertain with more or less precision. Shakespeare drew the plots of his plays from Boccaccio or Straparola, but these Italians did not invent the tales they lent to the English dramatist. King Lear does not originate with Joffrey of Monmouth, but comes from early Indian stores of fable, whence also are derived the Merchant of Venice and the Pound of Flesh, aye, and the very incident of the three caskets. But who would credit it were it not proved by conclusive facts that Johnny Sands is the inheritance of the whole Aryan family of nations, and that Peeping Tom of Coventry peeped in India and on the Tartar steppes ages before Lady Godiva was born. If you listen to Traviata at the opera, you have set before you a tale which has lasted for centuries, and which was perhaps born in India. If you read in classic fable of Orpheus charming woods and meadows, beasts and birds with his magic lyre, you remember to have seen the same fable related in the Kaliwala of the Finnish Wainomainen and in the Kaliopoeg of the Estonian Kalewa. If you take up English history and read of William the Conqueror slipping as he landed on British soil and kissing the earth, 
saying that he had come to greet and claim his own. You remember that the same story is told of Napoleon in Egypt, of King Olaf Harald's son in Norway, and in classic history of Junius Brutus on his return from the Oracle. A little while ago I caught out of a Sussex newspaper a story purporting to be the relation of a fact which had taken place at a fixed date in Lewes. This was the story. A tyrannical husband locked the door against his wife, who was out having tea with a neighbor, gossiping and scandal-mongering. When she applied for admittance, he pretended not to know her. She threatened to jump into the well unless he opened the door. The man, not supposing that she would carry her threat into execution, declined, alleging that he was in bed and the night was chilly, besides which he entirely disclaimed all acquaintance with the lady who claimed admittance. The wife then flung a log into a well and secreted herself behind the door. The man, hearing the splash, fancied that his good lady was really in the deeps, and forth he darted in his nocturnal costume, which was of the lightest, to ascertain whether his deliverance was complete. At once the lady darted into the house, locked the door, and on the husband pleading for admittance, she declared most solemnly from the window that she did not know him. Now this story, I can positively assert, unless the events of this world move in a circle, did not happen in Lewes or any other Sussex town. It was told in the Gesta Romanorum six hundred years ago, and it was told, maybe, as many hundred years before in India, for it is still to be found in Sanskrit collections of tales. End of chapter 8 Recording by David Martin